so I would not plan to um, go through the GitHub project and through the issues there as we have done in the past. We would yeah. be just doing the status of the documents and then get straight into the discussions around the various documents. If, so. if there happened to be time at the end, which there won't sure. be, it would be the okay. best. Pardon? Yeah, 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 I'm not. Sh there's nothing to be shared. <laughs> it's five, and there's no way to turn the mic off. Hi, everybody. Hi. Greetings from Italy. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> are we, which machine are we going to select? Share slides. From? I'll share slides because okay. you'll probably do more talking than us. Yeah. So let me start that up. Yeah. There's a, there's a table over there. Yeah, you can, you can sit next to the adult, you know. Pardon me? Adult is the interruption of this, of this slot. Each, each slot resets. Yeah, I know. So does. Uh... Have you met Henry before? Henry's J Jason Schema. Uh, okay, no. Present. Where is the present button? All right, we'll start in a minute or two. Welcome. Welcome to HTTP API, notable if only because it is the longest unpronounceable word in working group. Right? Pardon me? I mean, well, I mean, it's not a word, right? At least HTTP BIS, which is also seven letters, has BIS, which you can pronounce. But Hitapi is... Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> yeah, just be happy. There we go. Yeah. For those who didn't attend the, yeah, one of the one of the talks at the Peckett Kucha last night was uh, Wes doing uh, working group names as rebuses. So there was this outline of like six male figures and the working group was six man so it was, good. It was recommended to check the video out uh, okay so we'll start in a moment if you haven't already signed in uh please point your phone at that or go to the data tracker and, and sign in and do the tool it's important for us to get accurate room sizing and to know what conflicts we need to avoid uh, if you are worried about your ad tag tracking you or being tracked by your ex, you want to be in Dolt, which is somewhere else, not here. Okay. Uh, pardon me? Continental five. Continental five. Yeah, just follow the beeps. <laughs> All right. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, I'll be running slides. I'm Rich. Daryl will be doing most of the talking since he's more expert on this field than me. Okay, are you doing the intro? You think I should do the whole thing? Okay, first time for everything. Next slide, please. Um, 
we are several days into this, but you know there are some people who've joined us just for today, so please uh, pay attention to uh, our note well. And as a reminder, there is a set of procedures and processes to follow, and please uh, be respectful of uh, your fellow participants, and uh, uh, we take the KO Code of Conduct very seriously. Uh, as Rich has already mentioned about, uh, make sure you sign on either in the e Meet Echo or if you haven't, uh, come scan the QR code that's over here. And uh, remote participants, please make sure your audio and video are off unless you are presenting a session. And I think everybody presenting today is going to be here with us in the room, so. Uh, there is the link to uh, Meet Echo, and uh, we have the Zulip link also. Uh, so if there is uh, comments in the chat uh, that we are missing, I do have it up here on my screen too, but uh, please call us out if we're missing some uh, things that we need to address on the chat. Uh, but those are the links to everything that you need. And... First up on the agenda, and I apologize for this being horrendously small. Um, so uh, I couldn't quite tell how small it was going to be. But anyway, it'll be a little bit of a surprise to you as to what things are going to be on the agenda. Uh, as far as administrative goes, uh, Francesca, uh, our AD, is on leave uh, for first of April till the 31st. She will be back on the 31st. Yay. And uh, next up on our list, uh, we need a note taker. Can we get a volunteer to be a note taker in the hedge docs? So we can't proceed without somebody taking minutes. Um, all you have to do is just sort of say, this is what we decided in the group. It doesn't have to be a transcription. It doesn't have to record what everybody said. Uh, we'll have the video recording probably up tomorrow for that. Um, but we need a formal record of what happened here. It's really easy, and if multiple people do it, you just sign into the notepad, etherpad, hedgedoc, Cody MD, whichever version it is we're using these days. Thank you very much. Make sure to put your name at the top of the list so you get the proper credit. Excellent. Um, I would call out the next item is agenda bashing, but you can't see the agenda, so um, <laughs> feel free to suggest all the comments. And we do have a that slid off the bottom of the slide at the bottom, a, any other business at the end. So uh, if we move through these items fast, we will be able to talk about other things as well. Yes, so uh, first of we want to do some statements on um, the... Roberto, did you want to make a comment on the agenda? About agenda bashing, uh, I was asking whether YAML and REST API should be discussed together. You mean uh, open API and JSON schema together? The, the YAML oh. media type and the REST okay. API media type. Yeah, good call out. So that is the first and fourth item on the list. Uh, we can, yes, we can sort of have those conversations together. That just basically means moving that fourth item to be the second item. We can do that. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you. Okay. So first up on document status, we have the YAML media type registration uh, edited by Roberto that is now in the RFC editor queue. And so uh, it's fairly low down on that editor queue, but it is there and we'll be hopefully moving through that progress and will be published uh, very soon. So congrats to Roberto for getting us all the way here. Thank you very much. Which then brings Thank us Thank you to, to our group. Um, which brings us to the next item, which was the REST API media types that YAML media types used to be a part of and got split out and then successfully progressed. So REST API media types currently covers both the registration of open API media type and the JSON schema media type. 
Um, um, there are quite a number of issues uh, that seem to be open in the Jason scheme, scheme area, and um, therefore it would seem prudent to move to follow a pattern that has worked before and move the open API uh, media type registration out into its own document. Does anybody have any, Roberto? Yeah, uh, so I think that uh, the, the, the real, um, the real point here is how to ensure that the media type registration can be probably used in catalogs, for example, uh, and tooling to exchange uh, meaningful information. So while it's, it could be reasonable just to publish, uh, just to register, the, the media types. Uh, uh, it happened, for example, uh, on the YAML media type uh, that we had a long discussion on the fragment identifier. And we asked ourselves a lot of uh, questions about how to manage properly the fragment identifier and about tooling. And I think that probably if we want the media type registration to be effective uh, and interoperable between JSON scheme and OpenAPI, it could be the case that just filling up uh, the registration forms could not be enough because at that point, every provider, every tool will use probably the right uh, media type, but it could then add parameters or way of actually using the content that is not interoperable. At this point, we would have solved one of the issue that is we called OpenAPI uh, everyone will call open API as application slash uh, uh, open API plus YAML or plus JSON, but still we wouldn't have reached a seamless interoperability between tooling, between catalogs, and so on. Uh, so th this is for me the point. If we just think we need registration, it's okay if we are sure that it would be interoperable. I'm not uh, convinced of it. Okay. Thank you, Mark. I know you're having power problems here. Not about that. <laughs> uh, Mark Nottingham, just as kind of a meta point, um, just so folks know. I have a draft in the Media Men Working Group, which is um, this afternoon, I think, <clears throat> that um, suggests, and we've talked about this, I'm, I'm reasonably confident we're going to do this, that uh, uh, allows uh, community efforts like open source projects of a certain character to register media types in the standards tree. And so that would obviate the need to, for this group to be doing work like this, um, just, just so folks know. So don't get, go too deep down the rabbit hole if that's an option maybe for the future for you. So for example, open API could register its own media types. Without writing an RFC. Exactly, you still need a specification, but yes. it doesn't have to be an RFC. Yeah. C could you? Right, right now the requirement is that, that specification needs to be from an open standards body. What we consider to be an open, so us, the W3C, a few other folks, this is opening that up. Right. Could you um, give an opinion on whether there would be advantages to having an RFC for something such as open API? Um, That's a big topic. I mean, it's, it's up to that community, really. I think, okay. you know, um, what they want out of it and 
maybe we should talk to them about that. But the advantage of using that process that's being proposed is we don't have to sit in a room like this and do this. So, thank you, Mark. Um, without Chair Hat, um, just to address one of the concerns, Roberto, um, I think one of the challenges that we ran into with the YAML media type was the fact that there were multiple different fragmented identifiers that were possible uh, using uh, anchors. That is not something that's possible in OpenAPI, and therefore um, you have just JSON pointers. Um, can you join the queue? Yeah. Um, I'm, a, I'm allowed to have yes, him. You yes, can. you may join the queue. But make sure to in state your name. And say your, state your name. Henry Andrews. Um, so in OpenAPI 3.1, since it's using the, mo the more recent JSON schema with <coughs> dollar anchor, you can have plain text fragments that work within the JSON schemas. Um, and then, uh, as well as the, the, the JSON pointer fragments. Uh, and then there's also the whole thing of embedded resources. So there is a little bit of complexity in there in terms of managing what kind of fragments can be used in general and then inside the schema object. Uh, I, I think it's fairly well defined and that aspect of JSON schema hasn't substantially changed. I think the only thing they're still planning is making opening up to Unicode for IRIs uh, instead of just asking. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, we should we should have conversations on the GitHub issue and take into account Roberto's concern and see whether or not we do have to do these in parallel or whether we take the uh, the Mark shortcut. Yeah, I I think I think at least one of those issues on there. I think I do go over the different fragment things in there. I, I, I recall writing it, although I've written that in a lot of places, so I might be misremembering. Um, I think it is fairly, I think you could, you could define the handoff to the schema object without having to have a, have a, have a, have an RFC for the, for the JSON schema media type, um, in, in some sort of reasonable way, but, um, yeah, that's a, that's a conversation to have there. Oh, oh, and if we want, sorry, <laughs> I picked the microphone by accident. Um, if we want to, um, if in OpenAPI Moonwalk, we want to change the referencing structure. Um, would that be a different media type? Because then I don't know, like, at what point any of that needs to show up in fragments versus not. I mean, hopefully, if we're if we're switching it to a different kind of referencing, then the then the, the fragments become less of a concern there. Yeah, I mean, that's a conversation outside the scope of this. Yeah, yeah, but just just like yeah. if, we're, if we're saying like, oh, it's fine, we can just say that the fragments are this, then you know, we need to make sure. That's Okay. There's no other comments on that. Uh, Mark, do you want to give us an update on link template HTTP header field? Um, yeah, so link template, uh, we have had it on pause for a while because um, it includes things like the title uh, 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 parameter. And we've been waiting to see if the HTTP working group is going to publish a revision of, of structured fields that allows non-ASCII characters. And lo and behold, it has. Um, so we can do that now. We can have non-ASCII titles if we so wish. I think. Uh, it, it raises kind of an interesting question uh, about how we handle other extensions in link template in that um, to, to, to use structured fields, you need to know how to map things to uh, uh, the different types. And so with an extension that uh, uh, people are, or, or, or a new parameter that people are defining for a, a link, and of course they could be defined by, you know, an, an, the relation type itself or the serialization or, or whatever. Um, how do we in, how, how do we find out what the type of that thing is if they don't define it? Um, and I have some ideas about text we can write to take care of that, but it's probably going to be along the lines of it must either be a string or or a, what we call a display string, this internationalized string. 
So there's some more um, text to write, and I think we need to incorporate that display string for at least for titles, and hopefully we'll be able to ship it relatively soon. I don't think there are any other issues that are outstanding. Excellent. If you could just stay there for a moment. Um, problem details yes, yes, is is next. Oh, Hans Hans Jork has a question. Answer a couple, Odriga. Um, I shortly checked that draft yesterday after Daryl pointed me to it uh, nicely. And um, what I, f I got confused by one thing because I think um, I understand it's a header field, um, but I saw it also references web linking uh, RFC, but it doesn't seem to include a web linking rel um, attribute for the link template also, right? I would probably find that useful as well. If you don't have control over the HTTP headers to be able to do the same thing in the document, or did I miss something? I'm not sure I understand. So I understand the idea here is I can signal in the HTTP headers this is a URI template um, for the site or for the page, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or did I get that wrong already? <laughs> it's a way that people have have said that it's you know we just as it's uh, interesting to sometimes convey links in the headers. Sometimes people uh, think it's interesting to convey link. Uh, templates in the headers. So, for example, if if you have kind of a generative site where you have user accounts and each account has its own page, you can say, "Here's the template for user accounts." You know, put the user in the template, and then people can generate their own URIs without having to explicitly list everyone. So, with that in mind, yeah, so my use case is probably a little bit different. So, my use case would also be, um, and I'm not sure if this is in the scope of. URI right templates, but I guess it is somehow. You have sites like Google Maps, for instance, also, which have a certain pattern also in their, um, you know, in their URL, uh, which is not necessarily for programmatic use to a certain extent, but also for end users to probably construct links for that and so on. So for this case, it might be interesting for a page like Google Maps, for instance, um, to advertise this within the HTML so that tools can crawl that and probably provide a site like, okay, this is certain URI right templates that could be used by people. We can probably also continue this offline. <laughs> I think that, that's an interesting thing. Um, so let's take the Google Maps example. Um, if, if the use case is that I want to create a tool to go find that template and then create URIs from that template, that certainly isn't within scope. If, if, it is to, if the use case is to look at some URIs and pages and be able to derive what the variables in those URIs are, that's not in scope because URI templates don't work that way. But the first is what you want to do. Yeah, I, I think that's within scope. So what do you think is missing? Yeah, so I think uh, as a site owner, if I'm Google Maps or whoever, yeah. I might not be able to put this only in the headers because I, for some reason I might not have control on the header. Yeah? And, and crawlers typically might just analyze from any kind of metadata the HTML. Therefore, it might be interesting to have, it, to have an alternative way of using the web linking stuff, right? I, I don't disagree. We don't control HTML in this room, unfortunately. Yeah. Much more interesting world if we do. But do you want a new link relation? I think I think this is a framework for that, and then you define the link link relation separately. Would be my kind of mistake. Yeah, but it's an interesting use case, though. Yeah. Okay. Could you create an issue, and we can just work through and see what the because it's an interesting. Use. Okay, now Mark, you got to go back and tell us about problem details. <laughs> okay, um, problem details is in the RFC editor queue, I think. Yeah, and we're working through a few minor corrections and the things that the RPC does, and we'll publish it. Excellent, thank you. Which brings us to deprecation header, um, which is not quite as happy a story as problem details. Uh, we have gone through a number of iterations of conversations about how to make the deprecation header come through. There have been some proposals about changing it to be a more sophisticated life cycle. Um, we don't seem to be landing on uh, clear consensus and direction and um, we're looking for people who are very interested in this topic that could maybe help move this draft forward. And if there aren't people who are enthusiastic about moving this forward, then um, what was the phrase you used? Parking. 
the spec. Just, we had spoken offline with uh, Eric Wild, and he is happy for someone else who has got time and interest to take the torch forward. Uh, if we don't see someone here in the room, then we will ask on the list. And if there's no action, then we'll just sort of park it, say working group isn't ready to work on this yet. Ever. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, cool. Um, so I'm pretty interested in this header, uh, specifically the current simple one. Um, and I think it makes a lot of sense uh, to, to, you know, any kind of HTTP client can just kind of intercept this and bubble it up to, you know, browser consoles and stuff. I think it's super useful. I'm also willing to volunteer to help push this through. Um, I'm less excited for some of the more complex uh, suggestions that I heard from the last ITF. Um, but um, so I'm mostly excited for kind of the simple version as it is right now. So I know that's helpful, um, but yeah. Okay, that's, that's great to hear. We should uh, continue to have that conversation. Excellent. Cool. And don't go anywhere ever. Oh yeah, right. you're, next, you're next up on the list. Do you have updates for us on uh, HB API authentication link? Um, so I don't, not really. Uh, I, I guess like since last time it was adopted, um, I nothing really. This hasn't been much discussion. I'm, you know, obviously I'm still interested in this. I've been, I made a first draft several years ago, and have been trying to, you know, get it a little further down the road ever since. And so uh, also not being super familiar with the the process, I feel like it feels kind of uncontroversial. So. Uh, I don't know what the next step is supposed to be. Should I just try to ask for more feedback on the list, or do you have any suggestions for me? Well, we we, we can do that here. So, uh, question to the okay. room: uh, who, Who's read the draft? Request to the room: If you're interested <laughs> in link relations for authentication, please uh, read the draft and provide Everett some feedback. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. We will... One of the things we can do is uh, we can ask for somebody in the security area to do an early review of it, if you'd like, like OAuth or something. Cool. All right. So the, the chairs will take that as an action and request an early review. Thank you. Thanks, Everett. Okay. So this brings us to uh, some of our more meaty conversations. Um, they're in our, I lost the slides. Um, in our, we don't have slides for this particular issue. Um, there was an issue brought up with regards to the uh, item potency key header. Uh, David Benjamin, is David in the room? There. Ah, you're hiding there. Uh, would you like to just um, share with us your, your thoughts on there? Uh, I don't think that the authors are in the room, but uh, it would be good to get feedback on your idea. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> David Benjamin. Um, so the comment was sort of, uh, so the draft, if I remember correctly, specified the name of the header, but didn't really specify the contents. It said something like, Something to, along the lines of to send it, you need to have a priori knowledge of the server's syntax for the value, which one strikes me as not really standardizing anything, and two uh, leaves off some like some so, uh, makes it so that a, a generic client cannot as easily send this thing. Um, I can think of a few cases where it'd be useful for a generic client, um, for instance, for better or worse, in browsers we retransmit posts a bunch. It's horrible, and I wish we didn't do it. Um, but one of the things that's kind of unfortunate is that there is no way for a website to deal with this, even if they wanted to. If there were a generic syntax, we could conceivably just send it by deep, send some default for a uh, random value. And then uh, this way, like, you know, we, we as the browser wouldn't be able to rely on it. But if the server wanted to recover against these kinds of retries, they could just check it. Um, I could also imagine that if the syntax were, were well defined, then some more convenient HP APIs could be built on top of it and so on. So 
when I say HTTP APIs, I don't mean APIs over HTTP, I mean APIs for sending HTTP requests. Um, so yeah, could we standardize a value? <laughs> So there was some wording that was proposed originally by David and, or I proposed and he corrected and we're trying to share the screen on the particular wording uh, to get feedback. I should have just shared it from my screen, but it wouldn't let me. Do you know? Yeah, yeah. We're getting there. Not working. That one, I can't figure out which screen to share. Well, maybe I can share it now that I'm yeah, just going to share my it. desktop. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. There we go. So, um, Again, without chair hat, the, the, the wording said clients may choose to send an item potency key field with any valid random SF string to indicate the user's intent is to only perform this action once. Without a priori knowledge, a general client cannot assume the server will respect this data. The authors provided feedback that some of the words in there were not words that were already introduced, so it will need some wordsmithing, but um, it'd be interesting to get feedback from this group as to whether or not they think there is value in enabling this scenario of clients being able to assume that there's going to be uh, potentially item potency. This is where we flip the question around and say, does anybody have any objections to it? Okay, well, we will continue working with um, the uh, editors of the draft. Austin's in the queue. Austin. Hello. Um, no objections as such, but I was thinking maybe offering the option of publishing a, a method um, that would guarantee this behavior would be something to look at. That way clients could say, oh, well, you don't support this, then I'm just not going to risk it at all. Something like that. When you say method, do you mean HTTP method? Or were you using the phrase more general in a more generalized way? Something that would reliably fail if the server doesn't support it and the client wants that behavior. I don't know. Maybe, maybe hopefully that's not too much asking too much, but <laughs> I I invite you to come add that comment to the issue and we can uh, we can add to that conversation. Everett? Hey. Um, is the expect better? Is it something that, that's still useful? Um, because if there's an expect one hour continue header, which basically like if the server doesn't implement it, it must or it doesn't recognize the keyword, it must error. And I'm curious the, if that's... the expect header is hop by hop, so that might confuse intermediaries. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Um, Bhavna from Apple. Um, I, I admit I haven't read this draft, but I was just curious. Um, does this mean that um, the methods that guarantee item potency and the ones that don't can both carry this um, item potency key? The, when I say the methods, it's like your HTTP get or post or whatever. So wouldn't that lead to confusion and different implementations, uh, different clients doing different things um, based on um, whether or not, um, they, they based on the client's assumption of what, uh, if, if it sets this header, God knows what happens. So we wouldn't be changing the HTTP semantics of get, for example, right? That's outside yes. our charter and so on. But this could be a way for servers to say, well, how do I say, avoid the, do not hit your repost button while this transaction is in progress. 
I'm just worried that this is going to cause a lot more problems. For example, um, some browsers do retransmit posts, some don't. And it's even though the RFC says, well, don't do that. Um, so adding this, I, I just feel that it's going to add a lot more complexity. And, and that's more, that's my feedback and a lot more divergence. And then things work on some browsers, things don't work on other browsers. And that's just not right. Just that's my feedback. Go ahead, David. This is mostly a minor comment, but I guarantee you every browser out there retries posts. I believe Mozilla tried to get rid of this and it, there were servers that were relying on it because what we do is we, tr we retry them to deal with a race condition with connection reuse. It's, it's terrible. Anyway. <laughs> Just to add to that, I tried solving that. Um, uh, tried, no, I don't have a solution for it. And it was way too complex and then so I just, I, I'm just a little hesitant to get in there. That's yep. Thank you for that input. Okay. If there are no other comments on this topic, we will move to the next one. I've stopped sharing and now I've got to remember what is the next item on the agenda. We'll get there in a minute. Okay, it's coming. Oh, rate limit head is it's it's uh, my mine. I take off my chair hat again. You want to show the slides for me? Okay, so. Um, somebody in the queue there. Yeah, Aaron. Uh, Aaron Perecki, sorry. I was wondering if I can go back one topic and make a comment about the linked relation. Sure. Cool. Um, yeah, so I did skim the draft on the linked relation authenticate header, and I was curious who is the intended consumer of that header? Because uh, the only mention of a consumer of the header I found in the draft was browsers. Everett, Ever, do you want to take that? Perhaps not. Um, post the question to the list, okay. and we'll get an answer out of it that way. Uh, yeah, my, my question is, uh, who's the intended consumer? Because it seems like if there's not an API consumer, then I'm, I don't really understand the purpose of the header in, in the HTTP API group. Okay. If it's a browser intended to consume, it seems like it's going to need to be done in a browser uh, vendor environment. Would it be reasonable for a some kind of native client to consume it? Not entirely sure yet. I haven't thought through, but that's why I was curious to know more about the intended uses of it. Sure. It seems pretty sparse in the draft right now. Okay. Well, that's good feedback. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, this is a proposal for uh, a change to uh, our rate limit header um, specification that um, I've started working on with Roberto. Uh, if you recall from a previous, I think in IETF 115, we made the call that uh, the rate limit header would be um, reduced to a single header field with um, a dictionary, structured fields dictionary. Uh, and Roberto made that change in draft 07. Uh, so you can now define a policy and you can say, what are the different limits that are uh, applicable to a particular resource? And by using different um, limit values, you can actually have different amounts in different windows. So you could protect in a short period of time against spikes, and you can also have quota limits. But at the moment, the assumption is for the same resource, those quota units 
have to be the same. So you can do a number of requests, but you couldn't do number of requests and number of bytes uh, against the same resource. You could do it against different resources, so have one resource that's limited by bytes and another one that's limited by requests, but you can't have two different limits uh, on the same. The, also, when you get that rate limit header back telling you what the remaining is, um, the guidance is that in the spec at the moment, I believe it says that it is the one that is most close to expiring, which especially if that first limit value changes might be tricky to know, is it my protection limit that's expiring or is it my quota limit that is expiring? So uh, next slide. I have proposed that, that um, we introduce an identifier for the policy. And so uh, you have some identifier, in this case, I called it the first policy protection, the second policy quota, and when you return the rate limit header, you identify which of the policies you are close to uh, expiring, or potentially not close to expiring, depending on when the server wants to return it. This has the advantage of enabling you to uh, have different quota units that are protecting the same resource. Um, the current syntax, though, in this proposal still has the limit that you can only return one rate limit header because of the fact that is currently set as a dictionary. So you couldn't return both policy protection and policy quota because of the way structured field, because of header folding, header, those multiple headers would end up having duplicate keys. Um, and so uh, that particular syntax is uh, is is limiting, and I have another proposal. But Mark has a question. Would you like me to go? No, okay. So last slide. Um, this gets a little bit more terse, just because I could. Um, in this case, we use a an item, structured field item, to identify the policy, and then use uh, parameters on that policy to identify the remaining and the, the, the reset. Uh, this has the advantage of now allowing you to return multiple. It also has the nice side effect of uh, because those the remaining and the reset are just parameters, you don't have to, like in, in the draft seven at the moment, we have the keys and then we say, oh, and these keys are, are not allowed to have any parameters. Uh, we don't need to say that because you can't have parameters on parameters. Uh, and so that is uh, what I'm suggesting and looking for feedback on. Okay. We have one good. Anybody else have any comments? Any preferences between one and two? Any, well, phrase it another way. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Aaron? My phone is not on the internet properly. Uh, hi, Aaron Perkey. Um I guess this is ironically similar to my last question. Uh, what is the expected consuming use case of this data? Like, what do you expect a client to do once it knows which policy is it's approaching? Uh, that's question one. I have a second question. For that. You want me to not try and answer the first first? Yes. Okay. Uh, back off. It is an is a, it is a the ability for a client to control its own rate limiting so as to avoid the service uh, telling it it cannot continue, it will not serve that result. And it needs to know which policy it's violating in order to do that? Or it seems like it's just back off, is back off regardless of which policy it's, it's violating? Sure, because it might be, um, it might still have requests remaining hits, maybe it's uploading files. And it has a whole bunch of files it needs to upload. It has big files and it has little files. 
It's not running out of its rate limiting result uh, quota, but it is running out of its bytes. So it says, okay, well, I'll go and send a bunch of small files then, rather than sending, I'll wait a little bit before I send the big files. So in theory, it may be able to adjust the types of requests that it makes in order to um, uh, continue delivering value to the consumer uh, without getting blocked. Okay. okay, I guess it seems like you've already got all the information needed in just one of these headers in order to do that. No, because one of the headers, well, in this particular case, because you, you're right, in these particular examples, I didn't change quota units. I'm still just using um, the original example of uh, being throttled based on the number of requests. But if you were to imagine a new policy based called bandwidth, that constrained you on how many bytes you were allowed to download over the wire, then uh, you could uh, avoid um, getting throttled on that policy whilst continuing to make requests. Okay, I'm gonna have to put that together in my head a little bit later. Uh, but the second part of this is, um, it feels to me like there's a risk of the server exposing information that it doesn't want to. Like, there may be hidden policies or policies that it doesn't want to tell the details of to the client that it still wants to tell the client, like, to back off, but not exactly why. Like, and it seems like that's a pretty common case of, of trying to reveal just as little information as possible to the client while still making it able to do its work. So I'm a little bit worried about like if these names are really things like protection, quota, or things that might have a, a meaning that might reveal too much information. Uh, and it may be better to let the server do that in a way that doesn't, that's more opaque for the client, I guess. That's, that's fair feedback. My response to that is the server is in complete control of how it names those uh, policies and it is free to make them as obscure as it chooses um, but there are also we run into very common cases where um, customers are asking us to provide APIs that explain exactly why they are being throttled so that they can do something about it so there's there's both scenarios uh, and then going back to the original original question then uh, what's the purpose of naming them if the goal is just to provide the data. Like, can't you just provide the values without having to name the, the uh, Yeah, because there is needs to be out of band communication to, to say what is the unit uh, of protection and what is the unit of quota. Right? In, in this case, they happen to be the same. But if, if like, nobody's going to look at bandwidth and be able to infer that it's bytes, it would require uh, out-of-band documentation to communicate what those units are. Now, we've had feedback from people saying, we also want to encode the units in here and there should be a registry of units and you need to provide those other things. And so that's, that's a whole other conversation that needs to be had, but okay. baby steps. Okay. Hans Jörg. Okay, Hans Jörg. Um, I think this is a super useful and interesting draft, and I'm a little bit uh, in a pity for myself that I uh, don't follow it more closely. So ping me anytime if you really need a deep review of it, I will do. So I just skim it from time to time by being here. So saying that, Aaron, if you need use cases or uh, why this is relevant, you can ask me. Um, we use this kind of stuff plenty of time in legacy APIs delivering that. Um, to the point you made in terms of exposing too much information, I mean, the fundamental consequence would be here just to deliver a 5.0 something throttled without anything else. Um, the problem is nobody is benefiting from that. I mean, that's bad for the provider and that's bad for the client because the adaption isn't really well done then, right? Nobody knows to do what to do in that case. And typically we talk about an authenticated uh, connection here anyway, so there should be a trust relationship between the um, client and the server. My actual point <laughs> um, is basically um, one thing I couldn't immediately detect. So um, I see the label thing here, but I'm not sure if this is also supposed to identify the actual policy in terms of how can I look that up in the API portal? 
um, because sometimes it might be helpful, or not just sometimes, but you know, there's possibilities also to request a race of that thing. You might be in development with that API, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, so, it's, so it might be interesting to have a mechanism here, so you already exactly also know which which kind of you know entity this policy is uh, attached to. And I'm not sure if this is already covered here yet. The second aspect I'm not sure is covered is probably where this from which layer in the stack this comes from. Because if I talk to um, a certain stack, you know, weight limits might apply on several, you know, um, layers somehow. So there might be policies kicking in from a firewall, from the exchange backend, whatever kind of thing. So that I think would also be interesting. Yep. It, it's That's an identifier yep. at this point in time. You can structure that identifier mm -hmm. to convey as much or as little information as you want. Uh, mm -hmm. We should discuss whether or not that should, whether the spec should define additional semantics. Okay. Thank you. Mark. Yeah, Mark Donningham. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm not concerned about the naming thing. I think that that's just a nifty way to be able to refer to, you know, a bucket of weight limits or a policy. Um, and you can put as little or as much, as you say, information. You can call it foo. You can call it one. No, you can't call it one because there's that constraints. You can, you call can it say, one. no, yeah. stop. Yes. <laughs> Don't. Don't use my site or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that the, actually the, the previous comment about uh, um, you know, different parts of the infrastructure is well taken. You know, that's a, that it falls right into the naming issue of, well, you know, this is from my CDN or my API gateway or you know, the database in the back end. But, but having that flexibility gives you the ability to, to do that. I think at most uh, you need some security considerations about naming and say, well, you, you are exposing things. Think about it. You know. Um, and, and doubtless, some people are not going to put all the policies that they're enforcing in this header, and that's okay, too. Um, it, and the beauty of this design is, is that it can be as simple or as descriptive as you want it to be. And I think that's appropriate. Um, regarding the use cases discussion, I, I, I have a hard time believing that a client is going to dynamically, automatically adjust its, its request rates based upon this information. I think that, 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 that would, that's the dream. Um, but uh, in most cases, I see this being used, and it's being put into a dashboard, it's being used during development to figure out, is my client, am I used to this API appropriate, and do I need to introduce caching, or do I need to think about how I'm strategizing my request so that it's a reasonable load and I'm not violating the rate limits. Um, so I'm, I think that that's, you know, I, I can very much see this being built into some some development tools and dashboard products to make that surface that information and make it more visible. And I think that's a reasonable impetus to standardization. Um, the, the, the other question I had was, and I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't read the draft in a little while. You, you talk about different units, but the unit isn't actually in the structures we're talking about here. And I mean unit in terms of not only requests versus bytes, but also requests for what scope of this API. Is it the whole API? Is it just this resource? Is it just posts? So forth and so on. So that's if, if, if there's nothing yet, we need to talk about that. So, so that that is an open issue. Okay. Uh, previously, what has been discussed is that um, the rate limit policy allows additional parameters, and so it, it has an extension mechanism, <sighs> and therefore you can go and add uh, scoping information, URI templates, some other mechanism in order to ad identify the set of resources. The one thing that killed me is like, how do we prevent naming conflicts on those extensions? And I discovered there's no way of creating a dictionary value inside one of those parameters so that we could like namespace the extensions. So uh, we are on to a, um, That's not the same as the JSON problem extension mechanism. Maybe uh, we should actually define some of those. Okay. Yep. Hi. Can I have a word? At, that's Roberto. You didn't join the yep. queue, but you are welcome to speak. Okay. So, uh, well, uh, to uh, make some, uh, some background, the general idea of having two fields was the, um, the point that if this information is not very interoperable, so it only applies to specific use case of provider consumer, 
then uh, the consumer wouldn't have uh, used process the fields. But if we think that we need to process all this information, maybe we can just have one field. Because the problem I see in, in this proposal is that the receiver should make a match between the rate limit and the policy. And it could be that just the rate limit could not be enough for uh, for processing the the inform for processing uh, could be not provide enough information for proceed for processing the um, the values. So, uh, if we think that we always need to make the match between policy and limit, maybe it's better to provide all the information in one field. If we think it, that it is possible just to consume only the rate limit without looking at the policy field, then it's fine having two. In general, I like proposal two better than proposal one. And about the security considerations, I think they are addressed in, in, in the current document. And it's essentially what uh, Daryl said. You're not forced to provide uh, information and that uh, you're warned that policy information should not expose infrastructure information. They are service information and maybe they just tell you that you are running out of money with respect to the service that you are buying. Not that you are uh, that the service provider is running out of infrastructure in general. Uh, about the point whether it's useful or not, you are not um, forced to uh, use those information. What happens in, in my experience in the service I, I, I have managed, let me say, is that uh, those fields are used when there is a cost of running out of calls. For example, I start a transaction that has five or 10 subsequent calls, but if I know that at a certain point, the transaction will fail because I'm running out of credits, let me say, I should be warned that uh, this will cause a chain of transaction that I already know they will fail. So um, to, to be sure, proposal two is better than one. If we think that we all, always need to process all the information, maybe we just can, we can just send one field. And um, you, uh, the, the current draft already contains a lot of security consideration uh, that address most of the discussions that we had uh, in this, uh, during this session. And um, well, that's it, thank you. Thank you. So um, the, there probably needs to be some additional security considerations just because uh, of this identifier that has been introduced because that could contain information that somebody may or may not want to share. Um, so yeah, it's probably not a significant amount, but I, I think there is some stuff to add there. Uh, you, you're, it, I, you'll notice that the in the rate limit header, I did remove the limit value. Uh, and so you are correct that if you want to know what that limit is, you have to refer back to the policy. Um, I debated on whether or not to keep that limit in to allow people to change that. The, um, the important thing I think about having the two fields, and this goes back to, I 
dug into some uh, history and some comments that feedback that you'd got much earlier on this project is that that rate limit policy uh, contains the information that is static and does not change over time and therefore uh, when you're working in H2 and H3 and you've got HPAC, you aren't paying a cost if you just if you want to provide lots of information like scope and quota and whatever else you might want to add into that policy. And one of the difficult things is there's no real clear guidance uh, as to when to send that rate limit, limit policy header. And so I think it's like it, if somebody sends it on every single request um, and it contains a whole lot of information that never changes, we want to make sure that there isn't some part of that field that does change that we're then losing those efficiencies. So I do think there's value in, in, in separating out the two, field, the two fields for perf reasons. Um, and I think that's... Yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say there. But uh, thanks for your feedback, uh, Roberto. We will continue uh, iterating over this. And, and I, I think in general, it was positive. But use case, oh, uh, yeah, I just wanted to talk to, to, to use cases. Um, to your comment, Mark, I think probably in Hans Jorg's world of migration, uh, there's a f quite a number of people who write very careful code on the client side. Uh, I've seen presentations from people in our SharePoint org that have demonstrated that if you can avoid wasting that 429 call, you can transfer at X percent times faster when you're migrating information from one place to the other. It tends to be very specialized stuff. Nobody's going to go and write generic client side middleware that handles the more sophisticated cases but there, there's definitely some specialized scenarios where they do it. Cool, okay. We are a little over time, but uh, I think we can catch up. Thank you everybody for that feedback. Uh, next up on the list is, let me just zoom in here. Uh, API catalog, Kevin Smith. Hi, Ron. Hopefully you can hear me all right from a, a wet and rainy England. We so, can uh, hear you. Fantastic. Yeah, so this one, thanks very much for this this slot on the, the agenda. So this is the API catalog, a well-known URI to help discovery of APIs. And it's kind of trying to solve a problem of how do people know what APIs you have, what they do, and where to find them. The next slide, please. Yeah, so the, the solution to those questions could be a reserved URI under the dot well known path of API catalog. And the the current draft I've got um, proposes that uh, a company that wants to make use of this puts it at a kind of well known host name, so a dot com, as I've got in the example here, uh, to facilitate discovery. And the draft is not attempting to mandate paths for API endpoints at all. It's just saying where the catalog is uh, to find them. So next slide, please. So following some helpful suggestions on the list, and thanks for those who did those, um, here's the current format of the API catalog. It's a link set per RFC 9264 in JSON, uh, and it contains machine readable link relations to help automate API discovery and automate API usage. So each API that you have is the, the link context, the anchor, and these RFC 8631 relations can be provided uh, for each of those APIs. You might not need all of them, but really anything which helps that machine discovery and usage is going to be useful. There's also an ability to add a link to human readable documents uh, and also a heartbeat status, which is good. Uh, and at the moment, we're looking to propose a relation for, uh, sorry, an IANA registration for one other link relation of API catalog itself, so other resources, resources can refer to this catalog. Next slide, please. 
so apologies um, for the uh, the small font there, but basically there's a, a an example with um, all of the the options included. So you've got three links, three API links, which are the anchors in uh, the coloured font there, and in each case the link relation is provided, so you can find out the heartbeat of the of the API, uh, machine readable description, human readable documentation, and then the final one, service meta. Uh, that's again from RFC 8631, which can point to things like policies of use, uh, that kind of thing, uh, which could be individual to that API. It could be for your entire catalogue, let's say. Next slide, please. Yeah, and what I'd look if we if we can agree to get this draft proposed, sorry, agree to this proposal to get this adopted by the, the working group, some things to develop and agree on would be um, having a binding to the, the link header as well. Uh, security considerations, I haven't put any thought or work into those at the moment, but I'd be interested to find out if they're, you know, what those were, that'd be good to know. Um, and we've had some, some recent discussion, in fact, very recent, just today, um, around the uh, the use of the X631 link relations of service desk, service meta, service doc, and a comment saying, well, service is a bit generic. Can we have something that says API, for example? So that's one to discuss. Uh, the other one is that you could actually have a simpler API catalog if all the APIs you publish are Hatios in that you could simply have a, an array of API bookmarks and just say, well, there's the links to them. If you're a machine, follow those, and that's your entry point, you'll find out everything you need to know there. But because not all APIs will be that way, um, at the moment, it's got that fuller ability to actually call out the, the relations to the service description, the human readable docs, etc. So thank you for your time. And like I say, that's just a request for working group proposals. So um, thank you. Excellent. We have uh, Roberto in the queue. Hi. I love the goal. I spent years working on catalog stuff. And I'm just not sure about the format. Since, for example, in the identity world, there are some kind of formats uh, and specification to share endpoints URL with signatures with additional information and I would probably look there uh, to check if we can reuse that work in order to provide to, to support all the various use cases that the identity world uh, implemented in exchanging URL endpoints, but in general, I love the goal, and the, I think it's an interesting word and wor work, and I support it. That's great. Yeah, thanks, Roberto, uh, for the support there. And yes, I agree. The the format I think is to be fully decided. Initially, we'd looked at some um, other existing formats, for example, and comments on the list were saying pointing elsewhere but yes i think that's a discussion we could certainly uh, continue alex hi alex Janowski, google um i had some questions about the intended use case for this because it strikes me that knowing what the endpoints are is sort of half the battle uh when you go and sort of look at what people are doing with api specifications for apis you tend to have code generators which are doing type checking, serialization, deserialization. And at least as specified, I don't think this format is rich enough for that. And simply in skimming the draft, I, I don't understand what all the intended use cases are. So like, what is a user of this API catalog supposed to do once it discovers these APIs? And like, what is the useful thing there? And that brings up a lot of questions around like, you know, versioning or compatibility with existing uh, HTTP-based RPC frameworks like gRPC and what the interoperability would be. So like, while I think this is kind of cool, as long as we don't tread into the territory once held by IPM WebSphere with WSDL files and the horrible XML things, like I could definitely see potential value here, but I, I feel like I'm sort of missing the connection to some real world use cases right now. 
Yeah, I suppose it's a fair point. I suppose like the, the generic use case is uh, letting people know what APIs you have and having that an easy to find standardized place from the dot, the uh, well known URI. But leading on from that, uh, once you've listed what APIs you've got, uh, having pointers to say, well, this is what you follow to find out how to use them, some of the considerations you mentioned, that seems a valid case as well. So like I say, it's kind of a, a generic case, but really the first part is making it easy to find what you have. Without chair hat, just to answer uh, Alex's question, uh, we build tooling that does client generation. And one of the features of the tooling is to go search for APIs to find the open API because it's hard to find because there's no standard place that anybody puts open API files. So having this kind of ability to discover the open API files would, would help our scenario. Um, question to Kevin. Um, we, you've called out numerous link relations that uh, would be relevant in the link set. Would it be your intention to um, specify in the document, here are the supported link relations, or would it be open so that people could add any link relation? Like, for example, Everett's auth link relations. Is it, is it going to be an open? option it sounds like it should be um yeah it's a tricky one when we when i first started it like i said i started off with just an array of api bookmarks which was quite easy in that it was just saying you just go to the bookmark and you'll find out everything you need to know but that's maybe a bit idealistic then we extended it to what we've seen in the example today with the service desk service meta etc some of which are optional but I see, I see no reason to restrict it as long as the link relation is understood, which it should be. As in, you see the link relation, you understand, okay, I understand what this means and a reason why to follow it and what to find at the end of it. So in that case, yes, I would see it, it should be flexible enough to support new relations, as you say. Awesome. Do we want to get sentiment in the room about adoption? Yep. Yep. Can, yep. Can we? I'm seeing two thumbs. Um, do we think this is appropriate work for this working group? I'm seeing a, a number of folks. So moderate interest from some enthusiastic people. Uh, I guess we take it to the list and uh, we will we'll do the formal uh, call for adoption on the list. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you. Cheers, everyone. Appreciate it. Okay. Next up on the list is uh, an update to byte range patch. Uh, so Austin previously uh, presented this document at a previous IETF and got a bunch of great feedback from the room and has since gone and done some updates. And so uh, we are looking to also identify whether this is now ready for adoption. Uh, Austin, over to you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, uh, yes, this is a uh, patch. Uh, next slide. Um, quick overview. You know, I want to change this to the first four bytes of the file. How do I do that? Turns out HTTP, that's kind of difficult. Next slide. Um, so it, actually, the, the last revision of HTTP did say um, you can use the content range header in a put request. And that is that has a particular meaning. But unfortunately, that you can't use that opportunistically. That might like, cause corruption or, or, or things. Um, so. Next slide. Um, if you throw this into a media type and use it in patch, then it becomes fairly reliable to use. Um, in a Stack Overflow thread, I think um, uh, I proposed 
well, why not just use this in a message or a, sorry, a multi-part byte range request, which has almost like the combination of these two things that have the exact same semantics. Unfortunately, a lot of people really despise um, multi-part. So I also threw in there a message byte range, which removes the multi-part separator formats. And then um, since last time, I also defined a syntax for a binary version um, application slash byte ranges, which is semantically identical to the multi-part byte ranges. Um, it supports arbitrary fields and things like that. Um, so in theory, actually, like HTTP servers could use this to response to multi-part or um, yeah, multi-part range requests. Um, but that would be a, a discussion for HTTP biz. Um, next slide. Um, Yes, to anticipate a question, it does define, or it, it talks about three media types, and all of them do slightly different things. Um, but there, there's a, you know, one multi-part byte ranges that already exists, might as well use it. Um, the application byte ranges, again, it, it adapts a binary format, so that's doing something useful. And then the message byte range um, is an extremely simple syntax. Um, there, there is an exact representation of how to parse it with a regular expression. Um, it's 100% identical to the ABNF. Um, you can prove that. And um, also just successful binary formats tend to have a human readable counterpart. So that's why there's three of them in there. Next slide. Um, so this is sort of an example of how you use it to um, upload a request in two, or sorry, upload a single file in two requests. You can use a patch to create the file, and then you can use additional patch requests to fill out the contents of that. Next slide. Um, next, is that it? Okay. Um, update one is, so I, I also did throw in something to overload the content range header. This is not technically a this is not legal HTTP syntax. So um, for the purposes of parsing the media type, th this might be barely acceptable. Um, but this could also be a question to throw to HTTP biz to say, should we update the, the semantics of the content range header to support indef uh, indeterminate length writes, um, which is useful if you want to say something like, I want to upload or download this file, which is indefinitely long. Maybe it's a live stream that's being streamed right at this moment. You don't know how long it's going to go on for. Um, but you want to skip the first gigabyte of the file. Um, so this is something that's missing, just completely missing from HTTP. And it's a feature that wouldn't be needed in this patch format as well. Um, so this might be something that bike should. Uh, next slide. Um, also added a, um, I gave semantics to the unsatisfied range form, which is normally used in HTTP when a request is coming back from the server saying, the range you gave us is meaningless, but here's uh, here's the valid range of bytes that you can request for. Um, the the meaning of that in a put request would be just set the size of the file to this size. So you can use the unsatisfied range form to just set the size of a file, maybe truncate it to zero. Um, it's added in there on the principle that patch operations should have an inverse. So if you append something to the end, you should also be able to truncate it off. Next slide. Um, and then finally, this isn't strictly related to the patch format, but it makes um, it, it makes using the patch format very, uh, it, it adds a lot of value to being able to use the patch format. The preferred transaction header, um, this is something I thought off the top of my head last session in Japan, and it got a few nods in the audience, so I just added this in. Um, it, the ability to specify if an HTTP request should be atomic or if, it should be able to do just a partial state transaction, particularly if you're in the middle of a put request and that connection gets interrupted, should the server just make that partial put request public? Um, I'm not very happy with the naming of this. Maybe transaction atomic I like, but transaction partial isn't very self-descriptive to me. So if anyone wants to propose a different color for the spike shed, um, I'd be happy to consider it. Um, and it is also it is generic for any HTTP request, so you can use this for post requests or anything else. Uh, I think that's it. Next slide. Questions? Oh yeah, and I, I wrote an implementation. Um, <clears throat> so this is an, uh, 
excuse me, this is an example where um, I, I took like the, the opening of the Wizard of Oz and you can see we're patching out a word, uh, we're replacing Kansas with London and making that twister uh, much more interesting. Next slide. And same thing with the, uh, the binary framing. So that's it. Um, questions? Great, great John Apple. Uh, so I, as uh, one of the editors of the reasonable upload draft, I'd like to see this adopted. And I, I mainly have three uh, things I want to discuss. Uh, first is I don't think it's possible to change the syntax of content range. That's going to cause compatibility issues with many existing implementations of the client and service. And so the second part, I, I'd like to see a slightly more defined semantics of the, the, the patch operation. Like, do, do we, can we simply do zero extend when there is a hole or uh, the server needs to keep track of all the holes in the, in, in the current file and make sure that they know that this part is not specified, that part is existing that could increase uh, the intonation complexity. Uh, and the, the, the third, third part is I think the application spite ranges uh, is actually a very generic thing uh, to, to support any multi-part uh, requests and responses. And that should be a separate document. And we are happy to work together on this. I think it's also useful outside uh, <coughs> five ranges. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the, the extension with, um, like I said, I, it, this, is, this is something that was fairly recently added. So I apologize if this is taking HTTP WG by surprise. Um, the, the overloading the, the content range syntax to support indefinite length rights. This doesn't, uh, this is not something that servers would adopt or that clients would ever use. So there's no possibility that it would confuse the existing use of the header. Um, and it is just special case that's saying, you know, if you um, if you see this header and it uses this syntax, then just special case it up. It's, it is sort of hand wavy. Um, if there's a, an objection to that on philosophical grounds, then we could just provide a different header name entirely and say like content range indefinite or something. Um, uh, you know, that can definitely be done. Um, second point, holes. Yes, uh, the, the specification specifically advises against um, sparse documents. Um, it suggests that servers should just reject any um, requests that would modify byte ranges outside of what's already existing. Um, but th there is a possibility that that could be a behavior that servers want to use in the future. For example, if you're uploading multiple documents in parallel, um, that could be something this is used for, where there would be holes, at least for a short period of time. Um, but in the absence of such server support, it just says, you know, reject any rights outside of um, the end of, immediately adjacent to the end of the document. Um, I, I didn't exactly catch your third question. Um, if you want to. Uh, the, the third part is a suggestion. I think the application spike ranges is like it's a standalone piece that can be used for any like uh, any multi-part requests and responses. Yes. And I think that's yep. Example. Exactly. It, you yeah. could, in theory, um, yeah, like clients could, in theory, send a header saying, "Hey, if you send me a multi-part response for a range request, um, I'd prefer it if you could send it in the <laughs> application slash byte ranges format." Um, and then th th that is something that could totally be done. Um, you can use that application byte ranges in. Um, multi-part responses, you can use it for a number of things. Um, but that's sort of outside the scope of this document. Um, but, you know, I'd love to see like HTTP WG take that up and, and figure out how to do that. Yeah. Okay, uh, Michael Tumim. Um, awesome, hey, Michael. Uh, thanks a lot. Hmm? Oh, hey. Uh, thank oh. 
Uh, thanks a lot for leading this work. I, I really appreciate it. I'm uh, interested in it as well. Um, I use similar mechanisms for doing collaborative editing where you want a client to submit little patches. Um, I am, so I have a, like two small kind of points questions and then a bigger question. Uh, the first one is uh, I have a mechanism in mind myself for doing the, uh, the pre for, for transactions that you're discussing, which I'll talk with you offline about. Um, and also uh, I do like the uh, general, generalization for byte ranges that gives you the indeterminate end. I think that's very cool. Um, but this also seems like something for HTTP. Um, uh, although you can do it in a small way, perhaps it doesn't affect other systems. That sounds cool. Uh, my big question here is, uh, there is a design decision very early on that, uh, in this, this approach that of, uh, where you want to be able to handle, uh, you said, was it uncoordinated or opportunistic patches? Yeah. yeah. And that's the, uh, because you don't know if a server, so the alternative would be to do a content range in a regular put, but you don't know if the server is going to accept going to understand the content range, and you don't want the put to obliterate the content there. Um, an alternative, uh, or, and you've taken the approach that here of having a, a separate patch format within, and then you need a multi-part content body in order to specify the different components and essentially stuff the content range into this multi-part. Um, and then you have to parse that. There's three different formats for that. An alternative here, I, I'd imagine, would just be to ask the server if it supports content range for a put um, by having a header, then you could do a head request. Um, that would add in an additional round trip of latency, but if you're doing multiple requests for multi-part upload, it seems like that's not a big cost. So what is the rationale behind that design? Yeah, um, the by using the media type in a patch request, you are asking the server, hey, do you support this? And if so, just apply this patch. You're asking both questions at the same time at a single request. Um, okay, so, uh, well, how would it sound? You could also just ask the server, like have a, have a new header to say, do you support content range input? And then we don't have to specify the multi-part bodies. Yeah, that that's, causes a lot of problems because you don't know, you have to ask each individual resource if you support this or not. Some resources might want to support um, partial puts and some resources might not. It's not something that you can deploy across an entire origin server generally. Um, so well, the, yeah, you, you would want to look it up for each resource. Um, is that yeah. too many? And, and if you're uploading a lot of resources, that just adds a lot of additional round trips. Um, the, the, whereas this, like, the, the only additional complexity is maybe having to parse out like, uh, you know, the, the header of the, the binary framing. Um, but it's, there's not okay. a whole lot of, comparatively, it's probably the case that, the, you know, using the binary framing um, or the, the message slash byte range format um, is probably the simplest option, all things considered. OK, so you're trying to avoid the additional round trips, and that's that's the reason for um, adding a new media type? Yeah, that's, um, yeah. OK, I, I, I personally lean on the other side of that design decision, but it's something we can hash out on the list, I think. Yeah, and if I recall, you also had some other use cases, like you want to be able to splice things in. Um, so uh, that would probably be a justification for a new media type on top of this. Um, I, I omitted from this, um, one of the goals of this is also to make sure that there's a bound um, complexity to applying the patch, which is proportional to patch length. Um, so with the exception of specifying the intended end length of the entire upload, um, all the operations should generally just write a number of bytes equal to the body size of the patch. Um, and you know, that's not true with things like splicing and things, which if I recall, you were trying to do. So um, we can definitely use this and build on top of this uh, and, and do more, define it like a new media type that does a wider range of things. Let's discuss it. Thank you. And sort of use this as a baseline, yeah. Marius? Um, hi. So just to also iterate a bit on what Guille already said, um, in HTTP base, we're talking about resumable uploads, and there is a significant overlap between uh, resumable uploads and um, the byte range um, stuff, as one of the examples yeah. you also showed um, showcases. Um, so I'm definitely in favor of adopting this, just to figure out what the overlap is and how the relation between um, our two um, attempts here are. Um, 
yesterday we we talked in HDB Biz also about um, a possible relationship between um, those two drafts. It didn't really come to any conclusions. So um, I think talking about this um, would definitely help us to figure out how we could collaborate on this and like maybe figure out if something from this draft we want to reuse in resumable uploads or if not. If not. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely in favor of adopting this. Um, one additional comment um, is that I think even the simplest form of the media type, um, I, think, I think that's message byte range. Um, like even that is, um, I think a bit more complex because you have like the body and the body again includes like request fields. Um, so you can't just like take the body and dump it into the file, but you have to parse the body again, which is um, a bit more than I think um, is necessary. I don't really um, understand why this is necessary. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one thing that I was a bit surprised um, when reading this draft. Um, but other than that, I think um, it's definitely worth talking about on in HTTP API. Yeah, um, you. I, I wrote a little justification to this media type. You wrote an email to the working group mailing list, and I responded with a bit of an essay. Um, I don't know. I, I would encourage everyone to to read that, and it sort of offers a justification for this. Um, the the overlap between this media type and resumable uploads and the other working group is this um, allows, this supports a subset of resumable requests where you're uploading uh, with a, like a put request. And then you can resume that upload with a patch request. And it turns out this subset of requests that you might want to resume is resumed much, much simpler than the generic case of what if you want to resume a post request. Um, and that's, that sort of forms the basis of why this was forked out from um, the, the generic case of resumable uploads when I was doing research a few years ago. Um, and then to answer the question of well, why, why is there a header in the patch and then a body, um, the only other way you could do it would be defining a new generic HTTP header that only has meaning within a patch request that uses this media type. Um, and that's not illegal, but strikes me as kind of awkward. Um, now, no, that is the direction I think you're going with the resumable uploads. Um, if there's performance reasons to do it that way, sure, that, I don't see any objection to that. But um, for a media type, like one of, the, one of the uses is to be able to talk about, I want to patch this document. Um, I want to apply this contents to that byte range. And you should be able to talk about this patch outside the context of an HTTP message. Um, part of the goal of this is to be able to talk about patches in other contexts as well, not necessarily HTTP. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Thank you very much. Would you like to join? Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, I, I think one question that springs to my mind uh, about adoption here is, are we going to make things more complicated if this is living in HTTP API and the resumable uploads is living in HTTP biz? Um, seeing as it looks like there needs to be a fair amount of collaboration between those folks, and there already is. Uh, so. That seems like a question we should answer. Yeah, uh, Mark Nottingham, I worry about that a little bit too. Um, I, I think this is interesting work and should probably go forward. But the, the coordination there is raises a lot of interesting questions. Probably not problems, but, but questions. So maybe the chair should get their heads together and chat before anything happens. OK. We will, we will have that conversation and um, bring thoughts to the mailing list for people to weigh in on. Uh, just curious how many people in the room or on, in the chat have read the document? OK. Um, is there anybody opposed to us working on some subset, maybe 100%, maybe 80% because it goes to HTTPI? Anyone opposed to adoption? 
Okay, that's good to know. Uh, we'll confirm on the list and we'll talk with those bozos over in HDPBS and figure it out. <laughs> hey. Uh, hey, I said we take her from very seriously. Hey, okay. What next? Uh, uh, would be or... Henry with uh, relative Jason Pointer. All right. Uh, hi, folks. Um, so, yeah, it's about relative JSON pointer. JSON pointer has been around for quite some time. Uh, why do we need a relative version of it? Um, the answer is some use cases, and we will see examples of these. Um, where we know a data location relative to, we know there's going to be some point, but we don't know where it is in advance. And an example here comes from JSON schema annotations, which are a way to attach data to some part of a JSON document that validated against the schema. And your schemas can match multiple locations. So you have the item schema that applies to every item in the array element, and you know that it's going to be something relative to that array element, but of course, that's going to match multiple array elements um, at runtime. Uh, and also, schemas can be reused in unanticipated context. So you might not know, uh, the, even, even if kind of the way you originally looked at the schema, you might know the absolute location that you could put an absolute JSON pointer on. Uh, if it gets reused, you might end up it might end up attaching to different parts of a of a document. Um, of course, URI fragments are opaque in terms of your of relative URI reference resolutions. So there's no way to piggyback on top of how URIs are done, where we have you know JSON pointers in, uh, encoded into fragments. Um, the fragment is either kept or not. That's it. Uh, so there needs to be some other mechanism to 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 do relative paths within a fragment. Um, and this also avoids the complexity of like queries and wildcards and regular expression matching um, that are involved in some more complex formats that can maybe do this sort of thing in, in some way. Uh, so this is just supposed to be simpler and faster. And it's also intended for use where we know there's a single match that is correct. We're not actually trying to scan a whole bunch of different options and pick one out of them. We, we know where it's going to be. Um, as long as we can, relative to some initial location. Uh, next slide. Um, so what are relative JSON pointers? They, uh, they break down into basically four components, which I, I highlighted there with, with brighter colors, um, grouped into two pieces. There's the origin specification, where am I starting compared to, so there, there's your initial location, and then it's like, where am I actually going to move to relative to this location before doing anything. And then there's, what do I do? Um, and the, where am I going to move to first uh, breaks down into a parent count, which can start from zero. Uh, how many levels up do I go in this JSON document model? And then there's an optional uh, index adjustment, which is if this is an array, how many, how far back and backwards or forwards do, uh, do I wanna go? And then once you've found that, that new origin, uh, you either take the index or name, uh, index of the array element or name of the object property by using the, uh, the little hash mark uh, operator, or you apply a regular JSON pointer, which might be the empty string. Remember, the empty string JSON pointer is the whole document, in this case, relative, relative to this origin. Um, so those are, the, those are the four pieces right there. Uh, this keeps it distinct from JSON pointer because you always have to start with that non-negative parent count and JSON pointers are always either empty or they start with a forward slash. Um, uh, so, so when you are potentially using both of these things, you need to say that you are using both of them. Neither is a, is a subset or a superset of the other. They're, they're distinct. Uh, and this also helps avoid people accidentally trying to encode relative JSON pointers into URI fragments, which does not have any meaning whatsoever. You have to pull the pointer out, do something with the relative one, and then maybe create a new URI. Um, so there, there are a few simple examples down there. Um, just plain zero, that's, that's a, that's use the current location wherever you're starting and, and the empty JSON pointer. So it's, it's wherever you are right now. Um, one and then pound is move up one level and then give me the uh, index or name relative to the next level up to the grandparent. Um, and and this, is, this can also be kind of combined with the um, JSON pointers can use a dash as an array index as the next thing after the, the next index after an array. So you can find out that, that next index that way. Um, and then 
the zero plus one slash foo that is start from here, assuming this is an array, otherwise it's an error, move forward one and then take the foo object, um, um, take the foo uh, object property, take the value of that um, by applying that, that slash foo JSON pointer as if that were the root of, of, the, of the document. Uh, next slide. Um, so the current specification is, um, talks in terms of having the document and, and, and your location and then evaluating uh, from there. And, and that is straightforward, except that parent and sibling access isn't really something that is part of how people think about the JSON data model. And most JSON-based tools don't necessarily have that. Uh, and I've seen at least one uh, JSON pointer library say, no, we're not going to add support for that because we don't want to deal with like parents and siblings. I unfortunately did not write down which library that was or why, but. Um, uh, so I think one thing that is uh, that would need to be resolved is um, another approach would be to resolve against a base JSON pointer and then apply that to a document. Um, this breaks it down to some fairly trivial steps and then the already, already known process of applying a JSON pointer. Uh, and there are potentially some things that are safe to do even without a document, uh, but, um, or, or we could potentially allow things saying, hey, you can do this, uh, it may or may not work. Um, I don't know, there's, there's, some, there's some interesting use cases around that. I think that's an area for discussion. Uh, but that seems to be the one kind of barrier to implementation that I have seen uh, that could be addressed in the spec. Um, and because actually the first time I tried to implement relative JSON pointer, because I did not originally come up with the spec, uh, that was what I assumed could be done. And then I realized that actually, no, there's, there's a couple of weird little corner cases to take care of there. Um, and then next slide. Um, there are already some plenty of impl uh, implementations out there, although not in every language that you might want to find. Um, there are a couple supporting index adjustment, which is relatively new. And it's not like it was really advertised or attached to something that would drive adoption of that. Um, but there are a couple of implementations there. I use that Python one extensively. Um, I'm the one who added index adjustment support to it, so I'm biased. Um, uh, and that Go one like, literally just appeared this past month. Um, there are quite a few implementations of earlier drafts, including um, the, one, of the, one of the very popular JSON pointer implementations in JavaScript slash TypeScript. Uh, and then the, you'll also notice that since it show up in these like suites of JSON-based tools, um, there are also there's some standalones, some attached with JSON pointer, and some in these larger JSON utility suites, which often include JSON schema, but not necessarily. Okay, uh, next slide is an example. Um, so here's something that I'm working on right now involves parsing and validating open API uh, documents. So there's a schema for open API documents. And so part of the parsing and validation is I run that schema anyway. So I added these annotation keywords. And what you see here is with this OAS examples is that um, there are a couple of example like keywords that are going to be in this instance relative to the location. So the, the example keyword and the default keyword um, here. And both of those should be valid against the schema in that little schema section. So in this, this case, zero says like, okay, this is the schema. The schema has fields, examples, and defaults. And we want the parser to read these little annotations and say, oh, okay, I know I need to validate those keywords, the value of those keywords against the schema. Um, and that can match in schema objects all over the open API document. Um, and then one more example, uh, the next slide. Yeah, so and then here's a, a more complex thing. This is going back to hyperschema, which is of course kind of in depth, you know, on hold, I don't know where that is. Um, but this is kind of the original use case and this shows some more complex things where we were using pointers to help fill out um, URI templates. Uh, so, I can go over this in more detail if people want, um, but it's 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 kind of attaching links into certain like array elements and then looking into the parent or looking into the next thing or changing where that link gets attached because the context of the link is not actually the, the, the place where you're starting from. It's, it's higher up in the document. And if you try to attach it directly there, you would need wildcarding. Uh, and we, I, we wanted to avoid wild carding. So you can, you, we found ways to always get down to a point where you just needed to, to have one unique reference to another piece of data. Um, and that's, that's it. So questions.
injection. Has anybody used these before? We have opportunity. Um, okay, there's no comments in the chat. No objections. Um, we can, if you're looking for the working group to adopt. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would like to, the, the spec has existed for years, um, you know, kind of in the same weird Blumbo's JSON schema, kind of just, oh, there's another draft every once in a while. And, but there's nothing really all that complex here. There's the issue of resolving without a document, or at least partially resolving without a document. Um, and, and I think that's about it. I, I use these a lot, and that's the only one, the only real thing that I've come up with that hasn't already been addressed. Um, other use cases here, like I have a schema with an annotation format that will take the data structure and automatically translate it into database queries and just load it into a database, um, for example, and that relies heavily on relative JSON pointers to express the data relationships, and then it just automatically maps that in, and you don't have to write a handler that maps it into the database. Um, so I, found, I mean, I found a lot of use cases. I don't know how many use cases other people have found, but... Um, there are implementations, right? There, so are implement, can... there are implementations that has not been a problem, and I mean, I mostly work in either Python or occasionally JavaScript or something like that, so I haven't had trouble there. Um, Somebody's used it because they yep. did, yeah, they got implemented. Yeah. Michael. Hi, yeah, Michael Tuman. Um, so I, I'm not using uh, JSON pointer specifically, but I am doing uh, adjacent work, which yeah. might be interesting. Um, I am working on a JSON range unit. So mm -hmm. we just talked about content range. Um, you can do a range unit in JSON that lets you specify a range of JSON, mm -hmm. um, which is, uh, you could use it for instance, uh, to specify like uh, five elements of an array, right? rather than just an individual element. Um, that's also useful for collaborative editing. Um, anyway, so um, it's similar, but it's not exactly this. Um, I haven't been thinking about relative ranges and I'm interested in incorporating that idea into my work as well, but um, obviously I haven't brought this work to the IETF just yet, but if you're interested in collaboration, I'm here. Yeah, no, that, that sounds interesting because you could express that, right, as a, as a JSON pointer to the array or to wherever the starting point of the array is, and then a relative pointer that says just plus five. And, and yeah, yeah, that, that, that sounds interesting, yeah. Do, does JSON path support a slice of an array? I don't know. It, I, it doesn't? Once or, once or twice I've looked at JSON path or James path for something and I've been like, I, I don't need all of this and I don't want to understand it. So I just <laughs> go back and use relative JSON pointer because it's so much easier to do. And, and also, even though it's not a formal acceptance spec either, it's just very simple. Well, okay. We will take it to the list. Take it to the list. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, you're up. Yes, link has. Mm. Hi. Next slide. <laughs> I can say that a number of times and we're done. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, web linking defines uh, a framework for thinking about links on the web, in, in not only in the link header, but elsewhere as well. Um, and it's paving that cow path of uh, uh, you have a link context, you have a relation type, a target, and target attributes, which is kind of the extension, everything else bucket. Next slide. <clears throat> and, and the spec says this, you know, that those uh, target attributes are defined by individual link relation types and by link serialization. So they're uncoordinated. They're just this amorphous mass. And, and next slide. What we're finding is, is that there are often, you know, use cases that are common between different relation types and serializations, especially when they're talking about HTTP links. When you're talking about interacting with an HTTP resource, you often need to say the same things. Next slide. So, for example, all of these things, I'm not going to read it to you, but there are, you know, different aspects of interacting with a resource. And interestingly, a lot of this information is also available by interacting with the resource and things like, you know, the allow header and, you know, the different sorts of things we're talking about. We're actually talking about some stuff in the HTTP working group that extends in this direction as well. But those are all protocol interactions, not link decorations. Next slide. And so this is just simply a set of predefined uh, target attributes 
that either a, a, a link relation, I shouldn't have said format, I should have said rent link relation type, sorry, or, or, or a serialization can, can kind of opt into um, to, to get that set as a well-defined uh, uh, basis for, for what they need to do. Uh, next slide. Um, and so then that's the question. I, I wrote this a very long time ago and I haven't updated it recently. I would need to take another path through it and see if it still makes sense. But I, I kind of let it sit out there to see if anybody was interested and recently bunches, not bunches, but a few people have come up and said, hey, yeah, we're interested in this. We really want to use this or we have been using this. And so it seems like an appropriate time to ask, hey, do we actually want to make this real? That's all I've got. Lunch? Uh, who's read the document? Oh, okay. So um, I think before we do an adoption, we probably you want to take a pass through it and post a new version. Does that make sense? Not unless people are interested. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I guess we'll ask if people are interested to have Mark do more work and we can confirm that on the list. <laughs> yeah. Yes? I, I, Oh, yeah, sorry, Everett. Oh yeah, I just wanna say, I'm probably one of those people that asked uh, to, you know, uh, already like asked uh, Mark to to keep working on this. We've been do using this for years. Um, so it's kind of, we've, I've been building hypermedia APIs for many years and every now and then like I need like a feature and I try to find it and and often I end up going to link hints to, and it's like, has it just the thing I need? So. Um, I think this is very useful. It's been very useful to us. Hey, Michael Timum. Um, I just have a question. Um, I, I saw that you can use this to know whether a server supports range requests. And I'd be very interested to know an example or a use case where I want that in a link header. That would really help me know. Um, it, it, that's merely there because there's an accept ranges header in HTTP. Okay, um, do we have some use cases that would help my mind also understand for, in general, for using a, uh, for the link header and sure. use cases, yeah. Ever? I mean, uh, I just wrote it down because I thought it was a reasonable idea. Yeah, yeah so, so um, for us, the, um, Kind of thinking about like how APIs are described, like the, the kind of open ID model is kind of an external document that has a set of endpoints. Uh, the, on the hypermedia side, um, the the endpoint and the features that are available there are kind of one of the same thing. So we wanted our endpoints to be able to self-describe which features are available as much as possible. And uh, so we also generate a lot of documentation uh, on the fly by discovering features on an API. So if we, for instance, like we have documentation where you can see a list of endpoints for, say there's an article or something, and then whatever operations are available there, uh, you can also see kind of what other features are, are available there. And um, so for instance, which uh, we might be able to render a form based on a JSON schema that was linked uh, in one of the link hints, because it's also described, it's a bit hard to explain, but there's a describe by that lets you describe um, the format that um, a request body should have if you did a post request on the target of a link. Uh, so that kind of stuff we use to kind of automatically generate forms and documentation. And um, so yeah, it's, it's that kind of stuff. A lot of it is for is develop, for us has been developer focused as opposed to focus on generic clients. So it's more something for humans to consume, I guess. If that makes sense. <laughs> He said that was very helpful, so thank you. Okay, cool. Uh, hans Um Actually, Evan partially answered a little bit what I had in mind, but my main question would be, having not read the draft yet, to be honest, um, but from the presentation, it sounded to me quite similar to something like Open API in general, and also to the API catalog aspect we've seen before. So even though I understand it's not exactly the same, but it might help somehow to you know, sets these things in relation, probably also in the draft a little bit to help people like understand what is the use case for this, how does this relate to that? Right. Yeah, and this is not a description format or any kind, it's not a format, it's just a, a vocabulary of attributes that you can put on links uh, if you so choose to. 
Yeah, yeah, but if you say there is like, you know, you can say like this is response codes or something like that, that sounds a little bit like an API spec for me already, at least, uh, you know, like lightweight one. It's almost a miniature one in a way in, in that, you know, we have links and we already adorn them in HTML, for example, with ty the type attribute to say that, you know, the, the media type of what you get on the other end of it is probably going to be this. Um, this is just expanding that to other aspects of how you interact with the thing using HTTP. That's it. I mean, I was basically just going to say, at what point when you've added enough links, do you just say, oh, let's just point to the operation in an open API document? Yeah. If you don't want to interact with it uh, or, or, yeah. Yeah, if you I, want to I, embed it, right? This is potentially a building block that formats like that could use, I suppose. Uh, Henry Anders. Um, yeah, when, when I was working on Hyperschema, which again is often limbo, like we did add, add basically target hints uh, here and they, they mostly mapped to HTTP um, headers and it was just a preview on there. So this is, this, this feels like a, a useful thing to me because it felt useful there. Uh, and yeah, in that sense, it is a little bit of a API related thing and you can do, you, because you, Hyperschema is kind of in between where open API is with like, I'm describing an entire API uh, and just like the, the actual link headers, um, because it is templatized and it is describing a bunch of potential operations um, in HTTP terms. So, so to me, this feels, this plus the link templating actually expands a lot of what Hyperschema was trying to do, um, but without the whole JSON schema attachment. I, I mean, to be clear, this spec is not something that would be used directly by somebody you know, working on an API. It's gonna be used right. by link relation specifications and by format specifications, ideally. Right, right. So it's it's a it's a layer of indirection, but that that kind of decomplexifies certain <laughs> other aspects, which yeah. you know, like the 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 hyperschema spec for this is fairly complicated. Um, so I, I find that appealing. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think this is all. You know, I would characterize this as relatively low hanging fruit. That yeah, this should be easy to agree on. It's all the other stuff about description and everything that's hard. Yeah, yeah, and I think that was part of Hyperschema's problem is like it just tried to, you know, okay, here's all the URI templating with extra complicated things, and here's all the hinting with extra complicated things. So, so yeah, decomposing this feels helpful. Cool. So, do you have, do you feel there's enough support to make it worth your while to proceed? Um, or do you want to like look at the list? Go I'm to the list? If you want to do a call for adoption, I'm happy to, to you know, abide by that. Okay. We'll, I mean, uh, well, I'm happy to put work into this if people feel that it's worth putting work into. And the only way to determine that is to do a call for adoption. So. Okay. My, my question, I guess, was I th picking up on something I thought you had said before. Well, yeah, I need to dust this off a bit first. And is, did I mishear the first? No, I can do that in the process. I don't need to dust it off to, you know. Okay. Yeah. So we will take in it. We'll, we'll ask for adoption on the list. I just don't want to vouch for the entire document's contents because it's been a while. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Okay, excellent. Well, that brings us to the end of our agenda with three minutes remaining. So uh, does anybody have any other business that they would like to raise? And as my Mark said, lunch. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, thanks, everyone. This was like, I'm always surprised by how productive and how we managed to fill up the agenda use the time usefully. So thank you all very much.